Just as with film and music fanatics, there's a compulsion amongst smart pro wrestling fans to know as much as possible about their specialist subject, and the more esoteric the trivia, the better. Unlike film or music, however, pro wrestling is an art form based around live performance, with the ongoing action of comic books or a daytime soap opera, and the obsession with which many of us follow it means that if you tell a pro wrestling fan that you know pro wrestling trivia he or she doesn't know, 8 out of 10 of them will take that as a personal challenge and or insult. Are you ready to be challenged and or insulted? I'm Ben from Wad Culture, and here are 10 wrestling facts you probably didn't know. Number 10. Brock Lesnar has never been pinned on Raw. Brock Lesnar has never been pinned or submitted on any episode of Monday Night Raw. That may or may not be surprising, given that so much of his first WWE run was on SmackDown, and of course, since he's been back, he's not really played the kind of character that gets pinned or submitted a whole lot. He was considerably less menacing when he first arrived from OVW, however. The tale of the tape has Lesnar losing to Canyon, Billy Gunn, Albert, Lance Storm, and Hugh Bloody Morris in dark matches and a house shows before he was dubbed the next big thing and sent to TV to kill everyone in the world. Number 9. Alberto Del Rio wore scarves because Vince McMahon hates them. Ever wonder why old school Alberto Del Rio, Mexican aristocrat, used to wear a scarf to the ring? It's because Vincent Kennedy McMahon loathed seeing Chris Jericho wearing scarves backstage. The boss hated them so much that he actually considered it a heel move just to wear them. Everyone else probably just thought Del Rio was getting cold wandering around the locker room in his pants, but it's actually because according to Vince, they're the most villainous thing you can wear. Number 8. John Cena is a partying machine. John dresses like a five-year-old Cena is a massive party animal in real life, able to drink most people under the table, including the likes of Ric Flair and Chris Jericho. It's not something WWE like to advertise, given their squeaky clean image they prefer Cena maintain, but in his last book, Jericho tells the story of how he went out drinking with Cena, and later that night found himself waking up in his hotel room bed to find Cena sitting in his armchair in the dark, scrolling through his iPod with a drink still in his hand. He'd put a wasted Y2J to bed, and stayed up to carry on drinking Jericho's beer while listening to Jericho's music. Number 7. The Undertaker nearly retired in 2000. In late summer 1999, Mark Calloway suffered a nasty groin tear and would eventually be forced to take an extended hiatus from the ring to rehabilitate the injury. However, whilst he was recuperating, he tore a pectoral muscle, and together, the two injuries made it almost impossible for him to train or work out, forcing him away from WWF television for over eight months. During this time, he considered it whether it might be time to call it a day and retire. He said, I didn't want to go out in the midst of self-doubt and whether my body was going to hold up anymore. The thought came over me, you know, and it was like, you know what? You're gonna make a comeback. You're gonna go back to the top of the pile. You're gonna be the big dog in the yard, and there's no two ways about it. Number Six, the Big Show is afraid of little people. Paul Big Show White suffers from achondroplasiaphobia, I think I said that right, or the fear of midgets or dwarfs. Both Chris Jericho and Brock Lesnar have brought this to bear on show in the past. Jericho did it inadvertently. He had a group of midgets confront him and Big Show in the ring as part of an angle, not realizing how uncomfortable it would make his tag team partner. Lesnar, on the other hand, just likes taking the piss. He invited a little person of his acquaintance over for dinner and had him steal Big Show's food because why not? Number 5. The WWE's top title has had 10 names in 54 years. WWE's most prestigious world title has had 10 different names since its introduction in 1963, and here they are. The WWWF World Heavyweight Championship, the WWWF Heavyweight Championship, the WWF Heavyweight Championship, the WWF World Heavyweight Championship, the WWF Championship, the World Championship, then merged with the WWF Championship to become the undisputed WWF Championship, then there was the undisputed WWE Championship, the WWE Championship, the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, and most recently, the WWE World Championship. Doesn't WWE and WWF sound stupid now? I can't even say it anymore. Number 4. WCW's Gorgeous George stole the name from the nephew of the original George. When the Macho Man Randy Savage returned to WCW in spring 1999 after rehabilitating two serious knee surgeries, he came back with a new look, a new attitude, and a new girlfriend who had been nicknamed Gorgeous George. Those without an appreciation of wrestling history probably thought nothing of it. They didn't get the context. As we all know, however, Gorgeous George was the ring name of one of the biggest stars in wrestling history. His great nephew, one Rob Kellum, began wrestling under the name for the USWA in 1995, and in 1999 he was flown by the Macho Man, who planned to have him become the new 
gorgeous George. Whatever deal was being brokered fell through though, and Kellum didn't hear anything more until he found out that Savage had given his girlfriend the legendary name instead, which is a dick move. Number three, Andre the Giant used to be driven to school by a literary legend. Andre Rusimov began showing symptoms of gigantism at an early age. At 12, he was already six foot three and weighed well over 200 pounds, and apparently, he was too large to catch the school bus with the other kids. His neighbor, a writer named Samuel Beckett, had heard of young Andre's problem and offered a solution the back of his truck. You see, Andre's father had helped Beckett build his cottage the year before, and the neighbor felt he owed him one. A decade or so later, Samuel Beckett would win the Nobel Prize for Literature, having been cited as one of the most extraordinary and influential writers of his generation, with his masterpiece, Waiting for Godot. Number two. Dusty Rhodes was nearly just a jobber. When an unknown Dusty Rhodes defeated Grizzly Smith, father of Jake the Snake Roberts, incidentally, in Texas for Fritz Von Erich's big time wrestling, it was the beginning of great things for the future legend. It could have gone completely differently, however, because Rhodes was originally supposed to job to Smith. However, Playboy Gary Hart, one of the greatest managers and bookers in the history of American wrestling, saw something special in Rhodes and was appalled when he found out that Von Erich intended to use him as a job guy. Hart bugged Von Erich for the entirety of that day's television taping until he finally relented. Dusty Rhodes was going over. Working with Rhodes as a heel for years afterwards, Hart was instrumental in the babyface turn that created the American dream and even came up with the jive interview style Rhodes used, as well as the son of a plumber line. Number one the NWO's third man was supposed to be Sting. Everyone knows that Hulk Hogan turned heel at WCW's Bash at the Beach to form the NWO, changing the fortunes of the company and in many ways, the direction of professional wrestling in the process. What not many people may know though, is Hogan wasn't the original plan. The third man invasion angle with Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, the outsiders, had begun without an end game in mind. The angle was Eric Bischoff's baby and it was making waves and generating interest beyond the confines of WCW's traditional audience, but it needed a killer climax to take it to the next phase, and that climax was Sting. When approached five months prior, Hogan had not only said no, but actually thrown Bischoff out of his house. However, Sting was Bischoff's first choice. It wasn't perfect and Sting wasn't over the moon about it, but he was in. Then Hogan came back into the mix, having been watching The Outsider's Angle on TV. True to form, he smelled money in the air and had changed his mind. To the day of the show itself, Sting was the understudy, literally waiting in the wings in case Hogan changed his mind back again or just didn't bother showing up. And that's our list. Make sure you subscribe to the What Culture Wrestling YouTube channel for more lists like this, and don't forget to visit whatculture.com for daily news and articles. I'm Ben from What Culture, and thanks for watching.